The United States is one of the richest countries in the world. So why does it have a growing homelessness crisis? 59% of Americans are just one missed paycheck from losing the roof over their heads. On any given night, over half a million people will sleep in crowded emergency shelters, in a car, or in tents pitched under highways. And these numbers are expected to skyrocket in the aftermath of COVID-19. Rather than increasing shelters, many cities are installing anti-homeless architecture, increasing penalties for panhandling, and even busing people experiencing homelessness to other cities. But other countries have a different approach. What if we told you that in some countries there is commitment to housing as a basic need and housing as a human right? Hi guys, it's Dina, and today we're going to look at how three countries, Finland, Guyana, and Austria, are not only tackling homelessness, but preventing it too. First, we have to define what homelessness is. In the U.S., it's an individual or family who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. This includes living in a shelter, couch surfing, temporary housing, and sleeping in a car. But there isn't one official global definition of what it means to be homeless. Previously, the typical strategy to combat homelessness was a staircase approach. This requires changes in someone's lifestyle before they're eligible for certain things. As someone moves up on the staircase, they get more rights and rewards, with a home being the grand prize. Finland is doing the complete opposite. The housing first method is actually putting the traditional uh, approach to homelessness upside down. In 2007, Finland adopted a housing first model to end homelessness. The housing first model finds housing for those experiencing homelessness, regardless of income or if someone is suffering from addiction or mental health issues. Under this approach, the focus is permanent housing, not shelters or temporary housing situations. So the housing is used as, an, um, as, a, as a tool for integration rather than the result of an integration process in the shelter system. So even homeless people with very complex needs get the housing immediately. It works much better because you offer some stability, uh, also mental stability to the people, and so they feel more empowered to deal with the other, other problems, which is much more difficult when they're in the, in the shelter system. Did you catch that? You offer some stability, uh, also mental stability to the people, and so they feel more empowered to deal with the other, other problems. This is key to the logic behind Finland's approach. The Finns believe that having a permanent home can make solving health and social problems much easier. People have one less thing to worry about if they at least know where they're sleeping at night. But Finland is going beyond just putting people in homes. There are around-the-clock, individually tailored support services available to help people get back on their feet. This means helping people find jobs, financial counseling, treating addiction, offering mental health support, and much more. Homelessness in Finland has now decreased for eight years in a row. Freak also says that homelessness in Finland is now at functional zero, and sleeping on the street has been all but eradicated in the capital, Helsinki. Nobody questioned the housing first, housing led approach in Finland. And in some other countries, you see that if the numbers don't uh, uh, don't go down, that uh, opposition parties in the parliament will say, well, we told you it doesn't work. And that puts uh, the continuation of this kind of approach under pressure. So why isn't the US seeing as much success as Finland? According to some, it comes down to political will. And that's really important, but it's difficult to make it happen, you know, like time and uh, 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 consensual political support, I think, are probably two uh, key factors here. At the core of its success, the Finnish see housing as a basic human right. Technically, any country that is part of the UN should universally acknowledge housing in that way, since it's stated in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Finland may be an outlier when it comes to ending homelessness, but it isn't the only country. Some countries are tackling homelessness by focusing on specific communities. In Guyana, it's indigenous communities. Most of the population of the former Dutch and British colony are the descendants of indentured laborers from India and of enslaved Africans, with indigenous people comprising around 10%. Geographically, 92% of Guyana is rural regions, which they call the hinterland. Nearly two-thirds of households in hinterland regions had challenges with housing conditions. In response, Guyana's Housing Authority launched the Sustainable Housing for the Hinterland Program, SHHP. 
This program aimed to improve living conditions in the rural areas by constructing housing for indigenous residents, as seen in this footage by the Inter-American Development Bank. But instead of blocking indigenous communities from having any input, the Guyanese Housing Authority did this. The project was implemented in a way that really gave credence to the indigenous culture. Uh, we worked primarily with three distinct tribes. And so the housing models and the approaches utilized gave consideration to the unique features of those tribes. So they were not required to be brought into one particular space that disregarded their indigenous culture and belief systems and rights. Community leaders were involved in every step of this program from design to construction. According to Donnell, up to six people would represent each community at week-long workshops with Guyana's Central Housing and Planning Authority. Donnell says they would develop a map to determine the housing conditions and needs of their villages and create mini cardboard models of what the final homes should look like. Then the entire community would decide which households should be helped first. And again, it's not just housing. The program reportedly also provided safe drinking water, electricity, sanitation, and recreational spaces. When the rich build for the poor, we end up building poorly because we do not necessarily, uh, persons in that, what is called the rich bracket, might not necessarily understand what is taking place within those communities that they're building for. Uh, understanding that while we may be trained and have, you know, the, the knowledge in certain aspects, you still have to rely on the people on the ground. Donald emphasized that involving the people the program was trying to serve was key. Both Finland and Guyana's efforts are aimed at ending homelessness. But how do you prevent a homelessness crisis in the first place? In the US, lack of affordable housing is one of the leading causes of homelessness. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, a full-time minimum wage worker can't afford a typical one-bedroom apartment in 95% of U.S. counties or a typical two-bedroom in any state. Keep in mind, low-wage workers make up 44% of the workforce. We need to recognize the structural and historic nature uh, that racism has played into uh, our housing and um, the anti-Blackness and um, anti-Indigenous uh, uh, forces that have led for a disproportionate amount of people uh, who experience homelessness uh, to be Black, to be Native American, um, and to be people of color. We know that homelessness is a structural issue. Uh, it's not a people issue. It's the lack of affordable housing. Let's take a look at one of the most livable major cities in the world, Vienna, Austria. Here, two-thirds of the population voluntarily lives in affordable social housing, aka public housing, and it's rent controlled. And it's not a new phenomenon. Social housing has actually existed in Vienna for a century, built to house thousands of working class people living in overcrowded buildings. This period of time is known as Red Vienna. Between 1919 and 1934, during which time Austria was democratically ruled, there was massive public housing construction. This was mainly funded by a housing tax on the rich and a tax on luxury goods like cars and leisure activities. By 1934, 60,000 new apartments were built. And these buildings don't look like social housing in the United States. These apartments have rooftop pools, gyms, tennis courts, gardens, and many other social activities for residents. Here, public housing isn't synonymous with poverty. We have these ideas that having basic necessities like a playground or a pool or access to a gym is like making public benefits nice. No, it's saying that we care about the dignity and humanity of people. We know that when they have access to those things, they're healthier. They participate in the economy differently. They show up at school differently. And so that's, I think, the difference uh, in the housing model in other countries is that they don't view those things as um, amenities. One of the main differences between Vienna's social housing and U.S. public housing is who it's built for. Social housing is not just for those within the lowest income bracket. Anyone can live there. The residents are mixed income with higher income tenants paying more rent than low income tenants. Today, social housing makes up about 40% of the housing market in Vienna with about 5,000 new units every year. But in the United States, you know, we had a huge amount of investment in public housing when it was mostly poor white labor. 
we started to disinvest from public housing when more black and brown folks moved into public housing. That's been the history of our country. We disinvest um, uh, based on native erasure and based on anti-black racism. So we've established that the U.S. could learn from Finland by recognizing homelessness as a human rights issue and having political will from all parties and levels of government. Guyana by valuing local knowledge and including people in the planning process, not just talking about inclusion. And Austria by building more comfortable housing for everyone. Obviously, Finland, Guyana and Austria aren't utopian societies that don't have any problems. But they have implemented aggressive policies to house their citizens. And yes, it would take a large amount of government spending to get these programs started nationwide. But it's been proven to be worth the investment, even in the United States. Over the past decade, the federal government successfully reduced homelessness among veterans by nearly 50%. Three states and several dozen cities have provided housing for all their previously homeless veterans. So yes, ending homelessness is possible in the US, if the government and citizens cared enough to end it. When we see housing as a basic need, when we know that housing is connected to things like racial justice and economic justice, when we prioritize the dignity of, of someone's humanity by being in a home, we can end homelessness. It is possible.